Investor intelligence provides general information only. You should consider seeking independent advice to see how this information relates to your unique circumstances. Please refer to the terms and conditions available at investorintelligence.com.au for more. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Investor Intelligence, brought to you by the team at The Property Mentors. It's your weekly podcast for all things investment. My name is Phoebe Sikowski-Wallace. I am your host and today I'm joined by a guest that I'm thrilled to have and that is Herman Bernardi who is the Mentor Team Director for The Property Mentors. Welcome to the podcast, Herman. Hello, Phoebe. Thanks for having me. Of course. Now, Herman, you have a rather integral role here because as the Mentor Team Director, you not only manage our team of mentors, but you're also responsible for the recruitment across the business, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, and that's a huge responsibility. So how did you get to this point? Like what kind of background do you have to really specialize in finding the right people? Um, Yeah, so I spent eight years in the recruitment industry. Um, Probably very important to note that the recruitment industry and the HR industry are vastly different um, fields. HR, obviously, you look at Mm -hmm. um, internal structures. Uh, When recruitment, you work with a number of different businesses and essentially find talent. Um, So over that past eight years, I recruited everyone from sales executives, engineers, um, and then the last couple of years in my career um, in recruitment, I Mm. was recruiting executive um, staff. Wow. So um, that's given me a great insight to how companies operate when they recruit and also when they promote um, effectively. Um, And I guess how crucial staff is to the overall success of the business. Um, So not only did I get a good insight to that side um, of the industry, um, but it also gave me a really good insight to how people um, make decisions when choosing their next role, I guess. Um, And uh, Mm. more often than not, it is the next role that they're selecting, not how that role fits into their overall career. So um, I find that very, very interesting. Um, I ran my own business uh, for the last couple of years of that. And then obviously with COVID arriving, um, it became really clear to me <clears throat> that it's time to change industries. Um, the industry was getting a little bit messy. Um, and then that's when I've been given um, this opportunity to become the mentor team director here at the Property Mentors. Mm. Um, really my dream role because um, it gave me the opportunity to um, for the first time in my career to build a culture from the ground up um, and I can apply all the things that I've learned over the past eight years. Mm. So, yeah, that's how I ended up here. Yeah, and th- like the whole process of recruitment is is rather fascinating. So I'm interested to know more about that. So what are you looking for when you're bringing people into areas of this business, particularly, you know, the investor guidance kind of role? Okay. Um, well, first of all, cultural fit is probably our most important aspect when it comes to recruiting. We've got a pretty close-knit team here at the Property Mentors um, and we want to keep it that way. It's important that, that people feel valued um, because essentially if we look after our staff, our staff will look after our clients, the clients will look after our business. So um, that's probably first and foremost is whether you fit into the team. Um, In terms of recruiting mentors, it's a bit of a tricky one because we're essentially looking for for teachers, right? Um, The whole idea of our program is that you learn how to become an investor. It's not just about buying one property. It's about setting up a plan and becoming a successful investor. Um, So some of our most successful mentors I've got 
high levels of emotional intelligence um, and then mm. they're able to relate um, to clients. And that's really what I'm looking for. Um, property knowledge um, is a part of it, but we all follow the same strategy. So as long as you can learn and you can relate that information back to your mentors, that that's really kind of what we're looking for um, from, from that aspect. Yeah, and an incredible job you've done at recruiting, I must say. We've got a very, very happy office here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but your background really does tie in closely with our topic for today, and that is talking about why it's important to plan your career the way you would plan your property portfolio, mm-hmm. which I think a lot of people would, would never think of it in that way. But for most people, your job and your income are essentially the underlying asset in which you need to build a property portfolio. So Herman, what are some of the key aspects people need to consider within their career, particularly around selecting a company or accepting a job? Okay. Um, first of all, I just want to preference that I'm definitely not a HR guru or anything like that, but I have, <laughs> I, I've got the, um, I guess the insight that I've got from recruitment and then the understanding of how your job is essentially the fuel for your property portfolio. So I get a good insight um, of both of those. I would say the first thing to keep in mind is you have to have a plan for everything, right? So that's what Mm. we teach people here at the Property Mentors that if you're trying to build a portfolio and you don't know where where you're going to end up, you're going to make more mistakes on, on the way because there's no structure um, to your plan. Definitely, yeah. It's the exact same for planning a career, right? So um, when you're deciding to go into a specific industry or a specific product line or even a job type, it's important to think about what what, what could put that career in, in, um, in jeopardy. So mm. Yeah, so the key aspects um, that you'd be looking at um, would be staff numbers. So how big's the business? Does the business have appetite to grow? And mm. it, it's a key key factor if you are looking to get pay rises down the track. Um, small business is not going to be able to give you the same as what a large business would be able to give in terms of multiple pay rises. Right. Um, There's obviously exceptions to that rule. The second bit to look at is the business unit um, that you'd be joining. How does that fit into the overall business structure? Is it an integral part of the business? Um, If if times get tough, who's the first people that's going to go with essentially? Um, Mm -hmm. Probably one of the most important things is to use LinkedIn, right? So you want to go and search the company's name. Um, And you can basically set your settings to either look at past employees or current employees. And you want to see how long, how long do people stay in that um, business, not just the the overall business, but the particular business unit that you are going to join. So um, if you're a salesperson and you're going to, um, going to join Telstra for argument's sake, you want to kind of go and look how long those other salespeople last right if if, if, if yeah. most people stay there for six months and then they leave it's probably a reason for that um while you're on linkedin um a good thing to check is how do people get um promoted within their businesses do they go to a recruitment agency to go and hire a senior staff member or do they promote internally um mm. it's going to tell you two things right how much uh, career development you're going to get in that role, which is crucial to pay pay rises. Um, do they do they help you get to that next level, or when someone leaves, do they go external and go, okay, well, we'll just go and pull someone from a competitor, etc. Um, you kind of want to know, unless you're stepping into into a senior role or management role, kind of mm. want to see some sort of pattern of them promoting internally before going um, externally. Yeah, LinkedIn's such a great tool. That's that's amazing you say that because I would have never thought to use it in a way to see how people are promoted or hired, even though that's that's quite easy to do. I've always looked at it um, like who works there and, yeah, how many people work in the business. But I think, yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic tool to use. Yeah. Um, so once you get that understanding and you you know that there's appetite for growth, you know there's space for you inside the business to grow, you've done your research and, um, and people seem to stick with the company for a while, 
you basically want to make the assumption to say, okay, well, their retention rate's high, so their culture must be good, right? Now, culture is mm. different things to different people, um, but it's that's probably the biggest and most important thing that you need to look at because banks want to see stability. So if you've got six rolls in two years, the banks are going to look at that in, uh, as a negative. So um, it's mm. very important that you do that research. Then you want to look at the product um, or service that you're in. So if, if you're in a service-based business, what's the likelihood of, of that service being taken over by technology? Um, and I think it's a lot of businesses like that at the moment that um, they'll be asking themselves that question. Um, mm. And then if you're in a product-based business, what's the product like? Um, if you're going to be asking for salary increases down the track, are they already running on really thin margins? Like you, you need to understand whether the business you're joining are in a position to be successful. There's enough need for that product, um, essentially. And how might you find that information out with that point particularly? I have to think about it a little bit, right? So I would go on, um, first of all, if you're in a product-based business, is it a good product? Right. So I would go okay. and look at the Google reviews. I would go and look at all other review platforms and just see what people say. Same for a mm-hmm. service based business. Um, most people have a review online somewhere. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, go and do that research. But before you give an answer to, to an offer letter or anything like that, um, because mm-hmm. in my career, I can tell you 90% of people go, Oh, I really like the person that interviewed me. Um, I'm going to accept that role or Mm. this company is going to offer me the most money. I'm going to accept that role without doing any of this other research. um, And in my experience, if you're going to get paid way above market rate, there's probably a reason for that. So you Mm. need to understand that bit as well. And then lastly, what is your role in the business? So when you're looking at the business's bottom line, are you, if you're a salesperson, you're obviously revenue creating. If you're in accounts, then it's about compliance. So understand how important it is to have you in that business, right? And not only that, find out from the people that are interviewing you, how important is this business unit to the owners or the shareholders, etc. So find out mm. how important your position um, in the company is um, to the best of your ability and then make your decision on those key points that I've just discussed. Here at The Property Mentors, we have decades of experience investing in property. We know what to look for and what kind of impact it can have on your portfolio. We have access to brokers, accountants, and property managers to make sure your portfolio performs. Visit thepropertymentors.com.au to learn more. So you mentioned before, you, you sort of mentioned stability and just bringing it back to property, through my conversations with Chelsea, who's our amazing mortgage broker, lenders really do prefer stability and you know stable people with stable situations. And you did mention gut feeling as well. So would you say choosing to join a business based on that gut feeling is not as smart as doing your research? I think it's definitely a part. The gut feel is a part of it, right? Because Mm. you're going to spend as much time at work as what you would spend with your family, essentially. Mm. Um, So culture, passion, all of those things definitely play a part in it, but it should be the final check. So if everything that I've just mentioned checks out, they don't have high turnover, um, there's, they value the role that you're going to be stepping into, there's the space for you to grow, all of that makes sense, then go, okay, well, is it somewhere that I would like to work? What does my gut tell me about where I want to work? Don't, um, in my experience, people lead with the gut and then go, oh, yeah, I can see there's high turnover in the business, but it'll be different for me. Um, mm. It won't. Yeah, okay. So the research should really be the the foundation and then the gut feeling should come second. Yeah, yeah. Because at the end of the day, if you're if you're going to join a company based on just everything I've just mentioned, but your gut feel isn't right, 
you're still not going to get that mm. stability at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit of both. Just like property investment, don't make emotional decisions about yeah. a, a, a career the same way you wouldn't do about property. Yeah, I think that's a great comparison. So one of the key aspects you said to consider about selecting a company was whether people were promoted or hired for the role. So what mm-hmm. should people think about when it comes to um, you know, their career path and their career progressions within a company? Um, well, first you need to have a plan, right? Um, yeah. So bringing it back to property, can't build a property portfolio without a plan. Um, it's the same with a career. If you don't know where you want to end up, whether that's management, whether it's in a really specialized role, whether um, whatever it might be, whether it's more money or a certain figure you've got in your mind that, that, that you want to be taking home, you have to have a plan and then think about the decisions you make along the journey to get you to where you need to be, right? So um, we're not in the... Um, the 80s, 70s, 80s, where people would join a business and spend 20 years in that one company, right? That, yeah. that, those times are gone. Um, so typically people will spend three, four years in a business and then for, for whatever reason, they'll look to either move to a different type of product and in, in the same kind of role or, or that people are naturally... They, they want to be pushed. So if the business mm. that you're in isn't pushing you, you're going to go and look for that um, challenge somewhere else. So sure. um, planning what the next step is always. So once you hit a milestone, what's the next milestone is the first thing that you need to do. The second thing is you need to understand whether um, you are going to be capped essentially. Um, so if you need to do um, certain education or training or whatever um to get to that next level how is that going to fit into your overall life particularly if you've got a family when are you going to find time to do that to get to that next level um so having that plan to say okay well um i'm a sales consultant now and i want to become a sales manager in between now and five six years when when i do become a sales manager i need to make sure i get some leadership skills along the way that I can Mm. um, pitch to a client. The reality is for sales management roles, any management roles, a lot of companies go external to look for those positions, right? They Mm. don't typically recruit internally. Um, So if you've got that plan to go, okay, well, this is what a sales manager looks like. These are the skills I need to gain along the way. And, and build that skill set so you can get to that next level, you're probably going to get there a lot quicker than mm-hmm. sitting in a role, doubting yourself, thinking, okay, well, I'm not ready for that yet or the business I'm in has got a sales manager, that person's been there for 20 years, probably unlikely that I'm going to get into that that position. That's not going to help you with your property investment um, portfolio because you're going to be on the same money and there's going to be a point where your serviceability goes down and you, you're you going to have to make that tough decision to say, okay, well, I'm going to go and look somewhere else so I can get that pay rise so I can purchase another property. And that decision will be much easier if you start thinking about it now mm. and knowing that it's part of your overall plan. Yeah. I've never personally thought about putting a plan in place for a career like it makes so much sense for a property portfolio but it's it really is the same I think a lot of people you know they say I want to at least try this role at some point or I want to be in this industry or I want to work for this company but that's still not really a plan is it like it's really too broad so you're saying it's really important to actually almost put um, you know a five-year plan or a two-year plan or 10-year plan into stuff like this so that you can actually track that progression yeah, well, if you've got an end goal, that's that's a good start, but you're not just mm. going to go from where you are now to where you want to be yeah. um, at your peak. So there's going to be steps in between that and you need to identify what those steps are mm. and then you need to start regularly asking yourself the question, am I getting it in my current role? Um, am I yeah. being taught enough um, like what we do at TPM, um, at the Property Mentors? We probably do six hours of training every single week. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
Um, and that that's in a range of different things. And that's important because that means that our employees feel like they're always developing. So that's more yeah. how to keep your staff, but from, um, from a career planning perspective, understand the milestones in between where you are now and where you're going to end up and be patient. It's the same as property in, investment. You're not going to do it um, overnight. Yeah, yeah. But if you know what you're working towards, then it's uh, less bleak, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you've yeah. got that structure, you, yeah. you leave a little bit of wiggle room, but keep following that structure. Mm. So you mentioned, you know, what can kind of cap your career, but what things can cap or, um, you know, almost create a ceiling for someone's career progression? Well, education's the first thing. So it depends on what you're doing. We're yeah. talking about a very broad um there's so many different jobs that have so many different requirements and most businesses really don't have that old school hierarchy anymore um so i, I would say if you're in a um if you're in a, a lower skilled position right um then you might want to have a look at doing some education um to maybe get to to the next level um that that's the first thing the second thing is it's really kind of what, what I mentioned before um, about building those skill sets up, right? Just because you were a good salesperson for 10 years of your career, right? If you haven't actively gone out and tried to, to, to gain some people, leadership skills, all of those kind of things, right? You're not going to become a sales manager. So, um, and a lot of people get to that stage in their career where they're like, I've been doing this for 10 years. I really understand how to do this job, but that's not management. And re realistically, mm -hmm. management is where you're going to get the biggest pay increase, right? From mm -hmm. doing your job into managing other people that do the job that you do. So really looking at that side of things um, and going, okay, well, people, leadership skills, that's a pretty sure way to get a pay increase at some um, point in time. Um, mm -hmm. Other than that, it really is just the business you're working for. Um, so if, if the business has appetite to keep on promoting you and even moving you around different divisions in the business, then there's, there's always um, going to be growth there. But if you're working for a business that is doing stuff the same way as what they did it 20 years ago, you're probably going to stay in, in the same role as what you've been in for the last 20 years. So um, the caps are kind of the caps you put on yourself and then there's education and skill set. Yeah, yeah. And I have to ask this. So if someone out there, because there will be people, um, if there's someone out there that sort of feels that there's no progression in their role or, you know, they feel like there's other factors that are getting in the way of that, but they are still serious about investing, what would you kind of say to that? First of all, talk to a broker. A lot of people that come to us think that they can't do something um, and mm. in actual fact they can. Um, so that's the first thing. But if you've got a few properties, your broker's told you you can't you can't borrow anymore until you get a 20K pay rise or anything like that. The first question I would ask um, if, if you've exhausted a, a pay rise, if you're exhausted, maybe looking at a different business that's willing to pay you a little bit more, then you need to ask yourself how serious you are about actually investing, right? So if, you, mm. if you're that serious, then you would go and get a second job. You work on a Saturday, you would work at night um, so you can get that extra 20 grand to set yourself up for retirement. Yeah. I know for a fact, like I've known Luke um, for a while now, if there was a 20K deficit standing between him and purchasing another property, he would go and get a second job. Yep, because <laughs> sure it's would. Not, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's not. It, it's not supposed to be easy. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Yep, that's very true. That man would go to the end of the world to ensure that he gets that next property. <laughs> but thank you so much, Herman. I know a lot of people will find this episode super valuable. Um, and you did mention pay rises quite a lot, so we will have to come back and do another episode on that very soon. Um, and you know how to approach that and ask for a pay rise because that is a big part of you know, earning a certain income so that you can get a certain borrowing capacity. But Herman, thank you so much for joining me today. That's my pleasure. Thanks, Phoebe.
If you found this episode or any of our episodes helpful, please make sure to share and leave a rating to help us reach more people on their investing journeys. And of course, subscribe to be notified when new episodes drop. Make sure to follow the podcast on Instagram at Investor Intelligence Podcast. You can find links to our other socials in the show notes, including a link to the Property Mentors weekly blog. If you are ready to get your property portfolio in shape for financial freedom, check out Luke's latest book, Property Fit. You can get yourself a copy at www.propertyfitbook.com.au.